Hello everybody, welcome back to a brand new episode of Mega Project. In this one, the craft that you've probably heard of because of Elon Musk and also because of the SR-71, but it was all kind of secret, it's the A-12. We're diving into it today and let's get into it. If, like the rest of the world, you're wondering why Elon Musk, there we go, and his girlfriend Grimes, one word person apparently, names their newborn son the frankly bizarre name of X Ash A12, and I only know how to pronounce that A E thing, Ash, because I saw Elon Musk interviewed on Joe Rogan's podcast and he says it there, then you've come to the right place. And yes, it does tie in with our Mega Projects video today. The X stands for the unknown variable which is so cringe already. AE is the elven spelling for AI, or Ash, as I said before, but it is the A12 that is of particular interest to us. Some might suggest that it's a little strange to name a child after a high altitude reconnaissance aircraft. Yeah, I mean, Elon Musk is a bit of a strange man though, isn't he? But hey, I think it's fair to say that Elon Musk has been consistently thinking outside of the box for a while now and being weird. Okay, but enough with the baby names, let's get down to business. The Lockheed A-12 came with the exalted nickname Archangel. For those of you who are a little biblically rusty, myself included, an Archangel is an angel of high rank, a top dog if you will, and the Lockheed A-12 was exactly that, a thunderous Mach 3 Plus reconnaissance aircraft which only served the CIA for five years from 1963 to 1968 and was only officially declassified in the 1990s. It was a phantom during its time in the skies and because of its more famous younger sibling, the SR-71 Blackbird, it is an aircraft that has sadly slipped out of the limelight, until today that is. You may have seen a mega project we did about the U-2 aircraft, the American spy plane that was famously shot down over the Soviet Union in 1960. The U-2 had proven itself more than capable, but also much more trackable by radar than the Americans had initially thought. In that previous video, there was the example of like it being really high up. The Americans thought the Soviets couldn't see it, but there were MiGs scrambled, but they just couldn't get up there to find it. It was just too high. Despite much tinkering, known as Project Rainbow, the United States was not able to find a way to reduce the radar cross section of the U-2, which would have made it harder to track. So if you can't improve the old aircraft, well, what are you to do? Well, you build a brand new one, of course. You're the American military. You've basically got an unlimited budget. The American military often reaps the benefit of good old-fashioned competition, and it was through one such battle of aviation minds that the A-12 emerged. Convair and Lockheed were both given the task of developing plans for a new high-altitude reconnaissance aircraft that would be able to supersede the U-2. The Convair model was known as Kingfish, while the Lockheed plan was known as Archangel-1, or A-1 for short. If we fast forward slightly through the developments, the crunch moment came as Kingfish faced off against the Lockheed model, now known as Archangel 11. And I mean, Kingfish is a cool name, but Archangel 11? slightly cooler. It seemed as if Convair were about to pinch a lucrative contract, but in the final stages a few tweaks to the A11 meant that it moved ahead of the Kingfish, and on the 26th of January 1960 the CIA placed an order for 12 aircraft, now with the final name A12. The production project took the name Oxcart, which when you consider the A12's blistering speed is just a little bit ironic. The construction of this aircraft, well ahead of its time, begins with a wonderful tale of Cold War business espionage. Today, titanium is widely used around the world in just a variety of products, from space shuttles to tennis rackets, but its use in the late 1950s was still in its relative infancy. The US government typically received the titanium it needed from Titanium Metals Corporation, a US-based company. However, its stockpile of this chemical element was severely limited and was completely insufficient for the a-12's design requirements. There was, however, one country with plenty of titanium in reserve, and indeed one that pioneered its use in military hardware, and I'm gonna give you just one guess, because yes, of course, it is the Soviet Union. Of all the countries the US needed to try and procure this precious metal alloy from, 
well, it was its most fearsome enemy. As you can imagine, it was completely out of the question for the director of the CIA to pick up the phone and be like, hey, Soviet Union, I need some titanium. So instead, what they did was set up an elaborate scheme to purchase titanium from the Soviets using various back alley sources, third parties, and dummy corporations. This resulted in perhaps one of the most ironic ventures of the entire Cold War that a plane was being built to spy on the Soviet Union, which had partly come from the Soviet Union. There's just something very Manchurian candidate about all of this. But just one more point about the titanium. At this time, it was mainly used for small parts, but the design of the A 12 called for most of it to be constructed from the rigid and difficult to machine alloy. The aircraft's curved layout, therefore, proved to be a dilemma to its designer and builders. A solution was found to cut small fillets of the material and then glue them to the underlying framework rather than attempt to cut large scale pieces of titanium. As the design progressed further, these fillets were eventually replaced with strips of iron ferrite and silicon laminate, which proved to be pretty excellent at reflecting radar. As you might expect from such a forward-thinking aircraft, testing was a little bit rocky. The A-12 took to the skies for its first test flight on the 26th of April 1962 with test pilot Louis Schalk at the controls. The site chosen was Groom Lake, a salt flat located in the north of Area 51, and it was from this secretive location that the A-12 tests were carried out. Its maiden voyage was an almighty three kilometers at an altitude of just six meters over the salt below. Despite some serious wobbling caused by the improper hookup of some navigational Records, the flight was considered a success. The following day, the A-12 left the salt flats once again, this time clocking up a total of 40 minutes in the air. Again, this was considered a successful flight, but it did begin to shed its titanium fillets as it climbed above 90 meters. I guess the term success is a fairly loose concept here. Engineers spent four days searching the area for the missing fillets, and you know, we can see why because of the hassle that it took to get the stuff. In 1963, the program lost their first A 12. The aircraft, with the distinction Article 123, crashed near Wendover in Utah. Though the pilot successfully ejected, this did pose a problem of what exactly do you say when a secret spy plane crashes on American soil? Kenneth S. Collins, the pilot of the plane that had gone down, was dressed in a standard flight suit, which probably helped with the story that a Republic F-105 Thunder Chief, a fighter bomber that had been operating for the past five years, had crashed nearby. Suppose it would have been a lot worse if he had CIA secret project dude. <laughs> or just CIA emblazoned on his flight suit. Two farmers nearby were dissuaded from approaching the crash site with the terrifying news that the plane had crashed while carrying nuclear weapons. Now, obviously this was a lie, but it's certainly a surefire way to keep people away from the crash site. Nobody likes getting irradiated. Another way was through cash payments in exchange for silence. Apparently $25,000, which is about $209,000 today, was paid to each member of the law enforcement team in the area, and it didn't stop there. There were multiple stories of shady payments made in the coming years as the CIA attempted to keep the existence of the A-12 secret. And apparently, if you want to make a bit of extra money on the side, move to somewhere near Area 51 and wait for things to fall out of the sky. Don't do that's not advice. Three more A-12s crashed during testing. On the 9th of July 1964, Article 133 ran into problems when a pitch control survey mechanism froze at an altitude of 150 meters. This resulted in the plane rolling to the left, exactly what you don't want to do when you're about to land. The pilot ejected, but because of the trajectory of the aircraft, he was blown sideways. Somewhat miraculously, considering the altitude and the direction, his parachute opened and he managed to land safely. On the 28th of December 1965, Article 126 crashed just 30 seconds after takeoff due to a maintenance error, but again, the pilot was able to eject to safety. Things were not quite as lucky on January the 5th, 1967, as Operation Oxcart experienced its first fatality. No definite reason for the crash of Article 125 was ever given, but but most likely a fuel gauge error meant that the aircraft ran out of fuel still 108 kilometers from its base. CIA pilot Walter Ray did manage to eject successfully, but could not detach from his seat and unfortunately died on impact. Despite the numerous incidents, this was actually considered quite normal for an experimental aircraft like the A-12. It was quite simply operating at a different level than anything that had come before it, and occurrences like these were considered part and parcel of development. I mean, it's called testing for a reason. Things are going to go wrong as you find out the way to go right. But by the early months of 1967, the US government believed that the aircraft was ready and it was time for it to ship out. But before we go into the real-world missions that this plane flew, 
let's take a closer look at the aircraft itself. The A-12 is often compared to its successor, the SL-71, and looking at both from a distance, they are almost indistinguishable. The A-12's wingspan of 17 meters is exactly the same as the SL-71, while its length of 31 meters is marginally shorter than its younger brother. And I've actually seen, I've been to see an SL-71 in a museum, and it was way bigger than I expected. <laughs> as I mentioned earlier, the A-12 was considered a Mach 3 Plus aircraft with a top speed of around 4,103 kilometers per hour, which remains pretty extraordinary extraordinary even to this day. Concorde, which we always associate with record-breaking speed, had a top speed of 1,924 kilometers slower than the A-12. Although, to be fair, Concorde is a commercial aircraft and, you know, we don't have any expectations that it's going to go faster than a jet, like a, a fighter jet. Now, it must be said that much of the information around the A-12 is still classified. We have no way of knowing how often or if ever the A-12 is needed to travel at this speed. Just to add to the confusion, the SL-71 has a slightly slower top speed but still manages to beat the A-12 in some fastest planes in the world list. This is probably because they only cover official flights. And as we're going to go into shortly, the A-12 was a most unofficial aircraft. The A-12 also had a higher service ceiling with a monstrous reported altitude of 29,000 meters. That's 95,000 feet. That's not far off three times the cruising altitude of a passenger airliner today. Just to be really clear, that is 29 kilometers straight up into the sky. We would need 35 Burj Khalifas, the tallest building in the world, stacked on top of each other to get to that height. And just uh, before we continue, the Burj Khalifa, I'm not sure whether to do Omega Projects about that because there are so many videos already out there about the Burj Khalifa that I'm not even sure whether it's worth covering, but if you want it, let me know in the comments below and I shall oblige because I find it pretty interesting. I find skyscrapers pretty... I started a channel about mega projects. You are not surprised by this. The SL-71 has a service ceiling of 3,048 meters less than the A-12, which still makes it easily the second highest altitude plane in aviation history. The A-12 was powered by two Pratt & Whitney JT-11D-20B afterburning turbojets, each coming with 20,500 pound-feet thrust dry and 32,500 pound-feet with its afterburner on, which was often used during takeoff and evasive maneuvers. Afterburners are basically a part of the engine that allows it for a short time to accelerate, but it burns a lot more fuel with them on. So you might now be wondering if you've been paying attention, well, why is the A-12 faster but has less power in its engine? Well, this was probably down to the fact that it was six tons lighter than the SR-71. As I mentioned earlier, this aircraft was always designed to be able to spy on the Soviet Union. I mean, who else were the Americans going to spy on in the 1960s? However, the downing of a U-2 over the Soviet Union in May 1960 and the subsequent capture of its pilot meant that the United States was giving the USSR a wide berth at precisely the time the A-12 came onto the scene. It's a common misconception that the A-12 Archangel was involved in flights above the Soviet Union and Cuba, but as far as we know, remember, some stuff is still classified, these flights never took place. However, the United States had found itself in a completely new war, and the A-12 was sent to Southeast Asia. Operating out of their base on the Japanese island of Okinawa, the A-12s participated in Operation Black Shield, which was designed to get a clearer picture of the Vietnamese SAM missile defense system, military movements, as well as general surveillance. On May 31, 1967, Operation Black Shield got underway, with an A-12 flying at an altitude of 20 4,000 meters at a speed of Mach 3. Clearly, nobody was taking any risks at this point. Unfortunately, we don't know a huge amount about the A-12's involvement in the Vietnam War because much of it was or still is classified, but enough has been released to allow us to build up a bit of a basic picture. The route profile for flights involved in Operation Black Shield was often roughly the same. The plane would take off from Kadena on Okinawa before turning southwest. As I previously mentioned, much of the surveillance passes over North Vietnam were to determine the country's missile defense system as well as the position of roads, industry ports, railroads, and, well, just about everything else you could imagine. By the end of 1967, almost the entirety of North Vietnam had been photographed. A-12s returning would typically make an aerial refueling over Thailand before turning for Kadena once again. Interestingly, this route was said to have a turning radius of 138 kilometers, meaning that on occasions returning A-12s would stray into Chinese airspace for a short period. Whether the Chinese knew about this is another matter, but there were never any reported incidents. So 
Probably not, or they at least they didn't want to do anything about it. Things were not quite so simple over Vietnam, though. As I'm coming to shortly, one reason the A-12s had a relatively short lifespan was the rapid improvement of Soviet radar detection and, as a consequence, North Vietnamese radar detection. On three separate occasions, ground-to-air missiles were fired skyward at A-12s passing overhead, but only once did the United States come perilously close to losing their prized spy plane over enemy territory. On the 30th of October 1967, at least six missiles were fired from the capital in Hanoi. The pilot reported seeing four of them gaining on him rapidly from behind, and one came within 91 meters of him before detonating. We can imagine the pilot thanked his lucky stars and then continued on his way, but it had been an extraordinarily close call. A post-flight inspection actually found a piece of debris from a missile embedded under a wing perilously close to the fuel tank. Flights over the area were immediately grounded and wouldn't begin again for another two months. The SR-71 arrived on the scene in 1968 and joined its older brother in Okinawa, but at just the same time, the A-12 was going home. The American military sought no need for both aircraft, so to cut costs, the A-12 received an early retirement. But this wasn't simply because the SR-71 was considered a superior aircraft. Much had changed since the design of the A-12 first appeared in 1960. In just eight short years, the US had suffered the ignominy of losing a U-2 over Soviet airspace, as well as witnessing enormous strides in enemy radar defenses. The close calls that the A-12s had seen over Vietnam had shown that even at their extraordinary height and astonishing speed, they were still extremely vulnerable. The introduction of reconnaissance satellites, which began with the Corona satellite, in 1959 showed that manned flights to gather photographs were no longer even entirely necessary. Today, everybody knows about the SR-71 Blackbird. It has become almost a household name, I mean, as much as spy planes become household names. But what of the A-12? Not only was it faster and had a higher surface ceiling, but it laid the very blueprint for the construction of the SR-71. Missing out the A-12 when discussing great spy planes is like going from a Robin Reliant to a Lamborghini. Something definitely came somewhere in the middle there. The A-12 has probably been a victim of its own classified nature. While the SR-71 was announced to the world in 1964, the existence of its mysterious older brother remained under wraps for decades. The SR-71 may hold a catalogue of records, but is this simply because we've never known the full extent of the A-12's escapades? Well, we'll probably never know. It may forever remain a thundering, elusive ghost the skies. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that like button below. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel, all of that good stuff. As I always say, as I said with the Burj Khalifa, if you've got a suggestion for this channel, let me know in the comments below. I'd love to hear about it. And most of these are made from your suggestions. So yeah, suggest away and they will probably get done. And thank you for watching.